So, hi everyone. Um, John Rice. I am a uh, research faculty at the University of Colorado, um, and we are here today for the Weenar webinar series. Uh, we have Dr. Jim Thorson here um, to speak about forecasting non-local climate impacts for mobile species using multivariate uh, spatiotemporal extensions to empirical orthogonal function analysis. Uh, so we're very grateful to him for, for joining us. Uh, Jim is a senior scientist at the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, and the program leader of the Habitat and Ecological Processes Research at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center. Uh, his research is at the interface between statistics, ecology, uh, and fisheries management, including applied research in spatiotemporal ecosystem modeling, life history synthesis, and stock assessment. Uh, so Jim, uh, again, we're, we're grateful to having you here and, and please take it away. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, John, for organizing. And I'll also thank um, Roy Mendelson. I don't know if you're watching now or not, but um, thank you for uh, reaching out and connecting us about this. And of course, thanks to the you know, WINAR for organizing the seminar series. So, um, you know, I'll have a series of uh, sections here about empirical orthogonal function analysis or EOF analysis and why I think it's um, an important but underused tool for ecologists. Uh, I'll, I'll be upfront in saying that, you know, I think the, 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 the main message here uh, is that ecologists are increasingly dealing with community level analysis. So analysis, model-based analysis of, you know, records of, tens, hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of organisms that can be sampled at a given location, you know, increasingly with environmental DNA or other kind of high throughput technologies. And we're dealing with those arising from conventional sampling designs, like, you know, resource surveys, but also from citizen scientists. Those citizen scientists and new collection methods come in um, really heavily unbalanced designs, so opportunistic designs that are spatially imbalanced, seasonally imbalanced. Um, and there's also this pressing need to connect those kind of high throughput ecological surveys with climate information, so information about the physical environment. And, you know, I think that I'll make the case that I think this is sort of, you know, an existential you know, of existential importance for everybody and everybody's kids and everybody's grandkids for us to do what we can to provide accurate information about climate impacts and also to mitigate climate impacts. So, um, you know, the story I'll tell is, you know, to start here that, you know, of course, any organism, any, any you know, even very simple evolutionary, simple, simple organisms have senses and respond to their environment. And um, you know, mobile top predators like a wolf here, you know, a fox here, um, you know, are going to respond to visual cues, to auditory cues. They'll learn as they conduct a search through their environment and that um, their creativity to optimize their fitness is going to result in um, teleconnections in cases where, you know, spatially distant dynamics will affect what they do where they find themselves um, and that sort of non-local effect that results from intelligence of fitness optimizing animals um, is sort of this core of what I want to talk about. So um, yeah, so I'll talk about what I'm calling the grand habitat challenge. So um, how habitat science can go forward. Um, I'll bridge to a description of empirical orthogonal functions or EUF analysis. I'll talk briefly about how um, EOF analysis can be linked to time series samples, and I'm calling that EOF regression. And then I'll um, end with this ecosystem forecasting, so whole of ecosystem models um, using EOF and linking with climate models to produce decadal, decadal scale projections of future climate conditions. So, um, so I'll start out by kind of with a review of how population dynamics has historically talked about sustainability. You know, sustainability for the IUCN, you know, the, um, you, know, inter, you know, international bodies that define sustainability um, as people read about in the news or for fisheries. 
is typically defined for a population. It's not defined for individual sites and isolation. And its analysis is typically, you know, involves some kind of estimated environmental response, um, you know, some assumed response to impact and some density dependence. So, you know, the, the, the fact that as, you know, a population becomes large, it has a tendency to become less productive and that results in, um, you know, stability in population dynamics. And um, these population models have a statutory, you know, a legal authority to affect how we manage the oceans. So, um, you know, one example of this is uh, a recent, you know, paper showing how to do state space models for populations here in the North Sea. The, the first row is showing for North Sea herring, the second row for North Sea haddock. And on the x-axis of the left two panels is year, the y-axis is biomass relative to a biomass target, or um, middle row is fishing mortality relative to a target. And the right-hand side is showing that it started out with kind of higher than want desirable fishing mortality and a low biomass shown in that right quad that red quadrant. And over time in the North Sea, due to improved science, um, in part, you know, they've decreased fishing mortality shown in the decrease in that middle set, middle rows, middle column. Um, and that's resulted in population rebuilding for many species in the North Sea. So that again, this is a state-based population model, um, you know, doing this sort of, uh, you know, involving these components that I listed. So, um, on the other hand, there's, you know, an increased interest in what are called species distribution models or SDMs. And this is, you know, quite familiar, I'm guessing, for many people. Um, I'm sorry, I've got a subscripting here, I think, but um, the point is that this basically takes, you know, predicts biomass a response um, given, you know, exogenous or independent variables representing environmental conditions. And it does that at each, each cell, each location independently. So, you know, we typically get environmental information from satellites and like a, a raster or a gridded format. And we can um, estimate these environmental responses at every location in a generalized additive model or machine learning model and then predict it for every location. Um, and this typically, you know, this, this is a very different stack of process where it doesn't typically involve density dependence and it typically doesn't involve um, an ex you know, an impact, a human or anthropogenic impact that could be treated, uh, you know, under alternative counterfactuals to explore policy responses. So um, I guess my claim is, you know, that we have this, you know, ongoing, I mean, we're, we already are, are, are seeking to unify these two different um, traditions of ecological inference and, um, you know, the community is already doing that by embedding a population model at every location, you know, so in some ways this looks like what's called a meta population model, um, you know, and you can have density dependence occurring locally, you can have a local environmental response, you can have a localized um, response to human impacts, and people are already doing that, um, you know, although it's a, you know, relatively recent last 10 years, you know, in terms of theory and application. So, um, you know, I and others are claiming that, you know, this sort of synthesis would be improved by including stage structured effects, you know, age and size structure, because demography varies with size. We, it should include non-local effects, you know, so individual movement and environmental teleconnections. And, um, and then also mechanisms linking independent variables. So, um, you know, there's some, you know, there's some model that's necessary to understand the linkages among what are otherwise treated as independent variables. And it's important to know that to do attribution studies for dealing with direct and indirect causal pathways, um, but also to uh, account for potential errors when predicting into new environmental conditions. So, um, you know, this is sort of the, you know, brief summary of the landscape as I see it, and I'll spend the remainder talking about non-local effects and specifically this environmental teleconnections. Uh, and at the end, I'll talk about some postdocs where we'd like to address other pieces of this. So um, in terms of non-local effects, you know, obviously, if you take that same um, 
you know, synthesis of population models at every location and you try to connect every site to every other site, you end up with this like horrendogram. Um, you've got all these linkages and it's uh, likely oversaturated, uh, you know, not estimable um, without heavy regularization. Um, and, you know, of course, uh, you know, we can do sort of rec heavily regularized models that are then difficult to interpret. Um, I'm going to advocate that for, you know, given our legal environment, we want more interpretable models and, um, and the stack to do that would be to embed explicit movement um, in the link between biomass and future changes in biomass and that kind of density dependence and then doing what I'll call feature identification. So kind of dimension reduction to, uh, to deal with non-local impacts of independent variables. And so again, I'll talk, I'll, in the remainder of this, I'll talk mainly about feature identification, um, that kind of red box here. So, um, so to get started here, I guess I'll show, you know, this is a paper that came out in progress in oceanography this year. Um, here's a picture that a, a friend of mine provided for uh, Lake Olignagic. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a lake in the Bristol Bay uh, watershed. It produces a tremendous amount of sockeye salmon that's fished commercially. Um, you know, it's also in one of the least disturbed watersheds in the U.S. And, um, you know, this, this lab that I know, it, Daniel Schindler and others, at University of Washington were interested in thinking about climate refuges. So as it warms in Alaska and you know, worldwide, um, that warming will, that atmospheric warming um, will affect the timing of ice and it'll you know, warm the surface waters of the lake. And we're curious how you know, cold water adapted fishes will respond to that behaviorally. Um, you know, and so they, you know, one, one approach is putting out these river gauges in the headwaters and look, you know, that log temperature as a function of calendar date. And, um, you know, the, the kind of simple-minded hypothesis is that, you know, as warming occurs, these different headwaters will melt at different times. When they melt, they'll discharge a, a big pulse of cold water. Um, so that'll set up cold conditions in the headwaters that are highly variable seasonally due to the timing of headwater melt. But all of these will mix in the lake and then the outflow would be, you know, in this kind of like box box model, box differential equation model, you know, they'd be mixed. And so the average temperature would flow out and that would be less variable over time. And so there'd be this sort of variability that could be exploited by individuals to maintain a temperature preference. So they put out, you know, they also put out a temperature logger in the outflow. And, um, you know, in the, as I'm told, and I'm, I'm sure I'm getting details wrong here, um, you know, the story is that the headwaters, you know, sure, they have this variability in flow and temperature as expected. In the spring, the outflow was this sort of average temperature as expected. But, you know, every year at a certain date in the summer, there'd be this kick to the system where it would have really warm waters, suddenly warm waters, and then it would cycle on this oscillation. The temperature would cycle in a predictable and regular oscillation for the remainder of the summer and fall. And, you know, of course, after some thinking, they realized this is, you know, this is called seshing or, or seshing, I forget how to pronounce it, um, where, you know, in the spring, as the lake warms, it sets up what's called a thermocline. When the first storm, when the first spring or summer storm comes through, it pushes all the water to one end of the lake and the thermocline gets um, elevated. And then when the storm goes by, that thermocline rocks back and forth like the water in a bathtub for the remainder of the of the summer. And you know, so this I guess I like this as a story for you know kind of a really well studied microcosm of what happens in the oceans where you know physical characteristics, the physical extent and shape of the lake sets up sort of a predictable temporal frequency and that will determine sort of you know mobile animals ability to compensate for climate change. So, um, you know, in less well-studied systems, similar kind of oscillatory dynamics get set up. And the question is, how do we generically identify that statistically, given that our sampling data is multivariate, it's noisy, and it's heavily zero-inflated? 
Um, you know, again, this is important even with process knowledge of the oceans because we're, you know, climate change is causing ocean ecosystems to get into these sort of non-analog, no analog environments. Um, so we have to have statistical methods that are statistically efficient for rapidly keeping up with dynamics that get set up under new regimes. And so the, the, the approach of EOF is to do this additive decomposition of spatiotemporal variation into two components. Um, you know, one of them is a time series, one or more time series, and then the other is a spatial response for every species to each time series. So it's this additive decomposition of spatiotemporal dynamics into a, a temporal main effect and a spatial response. And, um, you know, people have been using EOF for a long time. Um, to study climate and weather. So, you know, one well-known example is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, where um, here the PDO has been defined as the EOF of, of Pacific surface water temperatures from satellites. And in a warm phase, there's elevated water temperature off the Gulf of Alaska, BC, and the West Coast. In a cool phase, the opposite thing occurs. And then we have this PDO index that's the temporal main effect. So, um, you know, showing whether you're in a positive or a negative phase in any given year and month. And, um, you know, that um, people showed that the PDO is predictive of salmon survival and returns. Um, you know, and then there's this sort of pocket, you know, in industry of trying to figure out, oh, is it the PDO or some other index now predictive under our new climate? You know, one that people talk about is the NPGO or North Pacific Gyre Oscillation, and that is defined as the second mode of variability of sea surface height in this case. And it's thought that that sea surface height is driven by offshore transport and has this effect on, um, you know, salinity and nutrient concentrations that then affects chlorophyll primary production. So um, you can see how, you know, people already start telling these stories about sort of, um, dimension reduction of physics and how it's affecting local uh, ecology. So, um, well, this, I, I say this conventional model structure, I, I was just putting the slide together. This isn't exactly, I mean, this is already a, a bit extended of a version of EOF, but um, in this case, you could explain surface temperature in every location S and time T as um, a series of intercepts that vary over time. So kind of demeaning. And then, um, a, the, and then the sum across n f factors or modes of variability, um, where you have the loadings matrix, that's the index for one or more indices f, and the product of that loadings matrix with a um, a spatial term omega. It's defined at every location for every factor, and that's the response, for, you know, the spatial response. And so, in this case, I'm defining um, the conventional version as already using a spatial um, hyperdistribution for omega. So that would allow you to deal with spatially unbalanced, you know, ignorable designs for your data. Um, in this case, I'm using a Matern spatial correlation function. Um, and I'll note that I'll kind of switch notation between parentheses and subscripts um, in different studies due to kind of notational needs at, at, you know, at a given, in a given study. Um, okay, so the extension of this that I'll, you know, spend the remainder talking about is, you know, just to embed this as a, a, a generalized linear mixed model, um, you know, so including a, a link function G and, you, you, know, a, a you know, a distribution model, a, dis a probability distribution density function um, H. So in this case, you've got intercepts for multiple categories C in time t, um, and those are predicted as a series of intercepts, again, to d mean it in each year, in this case, an index phase that's estimated every time for every factor, and then an index or spatial response map, um, which I'm calling x. I'm using script notation here to indicate that x and y could be, you know, function valued responses defined continuously over time, and those are fitted to observations y for every category, time, and space. So this is the multivariate spatial temporal observations. Um, and obviously in this, uh, you know, there's some obvious ways to set this up. You know, so physical data can use a, an identity link and a normal distribution. Biological data can use a Tweety distribution, log link. Uh, 
Um, and that's what I'll be doing for the remainder of this. So um, if you if you take this sort of generalization and try, you know, I just get a net CDF file for surface temperature from satellites um, in January in this case, and um, you know, fit this sort of statistical generalization to it, compare it with sort of the canonical PDO definition that's off online somewhere. Um, and you get a correlation of 0.92, you know, so this is sort of me just trying to convince people that I, that, that this it does in fact, this generalization does in fact work and replicate what is seen online. The NPGO, as I said, is the second mode of variability, but it's, um, you, you know, defined for sea surface height, not temperature. You know, surface temperature is correlated with height, but only down to the thermoclin, line. And so it's unsurprising that correlation is weaker, but you can still capture a lot of the, you know, the variance of the NPGO just via sea surface height using this generalization. So, um, you know, then the benefit of having this generalization is you can apply it to, you know, these vectors of observations for fish and crabs and other things that are living in the ocean. In this case, I'm fitting it to uh, observations for 12 fish and decapod crab species in the Eastern Bering Sea, which is, um, you know, between the U.S. and Russia off the coast of Alaska. And, um, you know, just showing the factor values that pop out. The first factor here using the, the kind of design I showed um, is approximately stable over time. I won't get into the percent variance explained um, unless I have time later, but um, the second mode of variability goes from a positive to a negative phase over this 35 years of data that we have. And then the third mode of variability has this sort of interannual variability. And then in about 1999, it kicks from interannual variability into these stands as a negative phase, a positive phase, and then a negative phase. So, um, you know, the point that um, I and others, Dave Wharton and Nick Golding and Jim Clark and many good statistical ecologists have made is that model-based inf inference for um, for community analysis allows you to fit a model and then recompose it into what you predicted about every response variable. That's not true of, you know, NMDS or um, Permanova or these other kind of classic community, um, community ecology multivariate techniques. So in this case, um, the model is predicting, you know, densities for Alaska Pollock, Tanner Crab, and Arrowtooth Flounder. And these, you know, I'll just say, you know, I, I doubt anybody's listening who, studies the system in any detail, but, um, you know, it, for people who know the system, this is showing patterns that are kind of the big picture story of the system, you know, so like Alaska Pollock in 2010, in the second from the right column, had decreased density in the kind of southern middle domain. That was a big uh, management concern because there's a billion dollar annual fishery for Alaska Pollock. Um, and Arrowtooth flounder in the bottom row is also showing this spill, increased abundance and in spill from offshore on the southwest, which is sort of the continental slope. And it's, its abundance is increasing and it's getting further in distribution into the middle domain, the kind of shelf of the Bering Sea shown in higher densities, these kind of yellow higher densities in the bottom row where blue is, is low densities. Um, so that's the, the first factor. Um, the first factor is the long-term distribution for every species, and it shows these sort of distributions that make sense. The second factor is going from positive to negative phase and has strong associations with like Tanner crab, where densities, you know, that response map is positive in Bristol Bay and the kind of eastern portion of the colored area for Tanner crab. Um, and that, that's where densities have gone down over time for Tanner crab. So it's highlighting that Tanner crab has gone down in density in Bristol Bay. Um, the third factor is sort of the interesting piece to me, and it's, um, you know, the factor just fitting to biological samples, it ends up with a 0.87 correlation with the cold pool extent. So the spatial extent of near freezing bottom waters in the Bering Sea. In the mid 2000s, there was a 40, $40 million dollar um, well, gosh, I shouldn't throw that number out. It was it was many tens of millions of dollars, and I can't remember the number precisely right now. Um, research program that identified the cold pool extent as being sort of an easy to measure proxy for um, interannual variability in the system. And so 
you know, in this case, you can fit to, um, you know, bottom trawl samples of these 12 different species and, um, and get this very highly correlated index of the physics that's driving the system. So, you know, this is a confirmation, an ecological confirmation that you can get interpretable um, physical drivers just based on biological measurements that result from that. And these response maps look familiar to an ecologist in the system where, you know, for instance, when cold pool is small and the index is negative, um, you know, we have uh, positive residuals in Gaddis calcogrammus, that's Pollock in the northern portion of the range, which is those negative response in blue in the top right panel. So um, the interpretation, so the Bering Sea biological data shows a strong signal of cold pool area. Um, oceanographic indices can be constructed from biological samples. Um, you know, so, I, and then um, I'll, I'll continue with these next steps as we go. So um, I'll, I'll thank here my co-authors, Lorenzo Cianelli, Mike Litzo. And um, a lot of the statistics is all done in, in Template Model Builder, which is a R package for automatic differentiation and um, the Laplace approximation for mixed models developed by people at DTU. So um, the next piece is a follow-up study that was also published this year in Global Change Biology, where co-authors and I, you know, having done this uh, in generalization of EOF, were curious about how to link it with time series. So um, in the following, I'll look at how an EOF on physics can be linked to spatially integrated measures of early life survival, larval survival of fishes, which we call recruitment. But it could also be used for other things like, um, you know, like seabirds have a colony where we get colony clutch size and um, nest, you know, chick survival time series. And so how to relate a time series to a spatially distributed environmental, um, you know, data pipeline um, is, I guess, the question here. So um, again, yeah, EOF we've talked about, this is using again, like slightly different notation, but um, in this case, we've got a multivariate response defined at locations X instead of S, um, but it's otherwise uh, similar. And um, yeah, and then there's, there's a new term Delta that comes in later. I don't really have time to get into the notation, but um, in this case, there's going to be physical measurements and there's also going to be earth systems model predictions of the variables being measured and delta subscripted by l allows a variable to be distinguished from um, a category representing a measurement type and um, and then in this case delta um, is what is called delta correction method or um, uh, yeah the, the um, delta change method and it deals with sort of systematic spatial bias between um, measurements and Earth systems models predictions of physical variables. So taking that EOF and, and calling the loadings matrix in this case lambda instead of L, um, we can take one of the modes of variability, one of these lambda, one of these um, time series that's being estimated as a mode of variability for physics and just plug it into a linear model for biology. So it's conceptually very simple. You just take a linear model for a time series and augment it with this sort of spatial temporal measurements of physics, where there's a mode of variability of the physics that's shared with the biological time series model. Um, and this is you know, easy to do for stock recruit models because there's a famous model called the Ricker model that can be linearized. So the log of recruits or juvenile individuals divided by the spawning biomass or the population size of adults is treated as a linear model in this case. And um, so I'll, 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 I'll fit a linear model to the production of juvenile fish as a function of spatially distributed physical environment. So, you know, a schematic for this is that we've got a physics component where we decompose spatial temporal variation for these physical variables in the bottom left into response maps and time series. And then one of these time series is, is used as a predictor for some biological sampling process. 
So in this case, I'll take bottom temperature measurements from the last 35 years from the Bering Sea surface temperature measurements in the in the in the winter from satellites, and then ROMS regional o ocean modeling system predictions for end of century conditions and bottom and surface temperature. And I'll fit these with stock and recruitment records for Pollock, Cod, and Yellowfin Sole in the Bering Sea. So in this case. If we fit a model and turn off the link between biology and physics, we just have an EOF that's doing delta change method to intercalibrate bottom temperature and surface temperature measurements with Earth systems model predictions, those same things. As I said, this is essentially what's called the delta change method. And um, these are predictions, th th these are maps showing predicted bottom and surface temperature, um, you know, the predicted measurements of those variables. Um, you know, and if you compare the first and the third row from the left, those are bottom temperature, predicted bottom temperature observations or model output from this Earth systems model that shows that by 2090, we expect radically warmer temperatures inshore in Bristol Bay, you know, off the coast, you know, near Nunavut Island, off the coast, coastal um, Alaska, and also in the Aleutian Islands up to the Pribilof Islands. So. Um, so we can do this delta change method using EOF. If we estimate the link between physics and biology, we can identify what physical conditions, you know, what response map is associated with the mode of variability that's shared between submodels. That's what I'm showing here. So for COD, we expect to have highest um, survival of juveniles when physical conditions, bottom temperature conditions look like this map on the top left. So cod have higher juvenile survival when there's cold water in the Pribilof Islands and cold water in inshore Alaska. Um, Pollock similarly has good stock, you know, larval survival when water temperatures are cold near the Pribilof Islands and the southern middle domain. Um, you know, both of those occur in cold years when this cold pool comes south from St. Matthew's Island in the north. Um, you know, and so both of those stocks, you know, just looking at these maps, we'd think that they probably have correlated recruitment and that they have good recruitment in cold years. And that's, that's of course, what, what we know from other studies. Um, and yellowfin kind of has the opposite pattern. But, you know, so the point is that Cod and Pollock have s similar maps of favored environmental conditions, but Pollock is cued on bottom, temp you know, bottom temperatures being cold offshore, whereas Cod is more interested in cold bottom temperatures inshore as well. Um, and then, of course, you know, fitting this jointly with a stock group model, we can do end of century forecasting. So, um, you know, the top time series, you know, the top column is a time series of predictions uh, for a, a normal stock group model in blue or a climate linked stock group model in red. Um, so that top left panel is showing that by end of century, we predict in this climate linked model that stock, you know, larval survival will go down in log space almost one, you know, or about a 60% decline in um, juvenile survival for cod by end of century. Pollock is also predicted to decline in juvenile survival and yellowfin to go up. And I'll kind of ignore the stock accrued panel um, for, you know, for, for this audience. So, um, so again, the, the idea here, you know, statistics is not intended to supplant sort of, you know, um, process research, we call it, you know, targeted field or lab experimental designs that um, actually look at, you know, in lab conditions, look at how, you know, water temperature affects egg development rates and, um, you, know, lar you know, larval, <laughs> you know, metabolism of um, egg lipids and, and, and think, you know, we can make experimental inference about these same things. Um, instead, something like EUF regression is a way of, um, you know, generating hypotheses about how multi-decadal changes in recruits per spawner might play out end of century. Um, it's also useful to identify locations that are probably most correlated with stock-wide process. So in this case, you could use it to identify an optimal sampling, spatial sampling design for where to put monitoring sites or, you know, how to allocate, you know, sampling effort. 
Um, and then, of course, you know, maps are a good way to visualize and communicate, you know, ecology, you know, so everybody in the world is used to seeing a map on their phone. And so the more we can take a time series model of population dynamics and show it, you know, map physical conditions that are associated with patterns, I think the better we can communicate. So again, um, thanking some of my co-authors, including, um, you know, 35 years of data from the ground fish assessment program and, and, and colleagues who did the earth systems modeling. Uh, and then the final piece I'd like to talk about today um, is trying to make the case that, you know, EOF is also useful for doing kind of whole of ecosystem modeling. So um, in this case, I'll be um, fitting to physics all the way up to upper trophic level data. Um, and again, this is sort of requires um, accounting for ecological teleconnections because all of these species that we're looking at are seasonal migratory species. And so as they are doing, you know, their annual tracks, um, you know, far field, it's sometimes referred to as far field effects, you know, environmental conditions um, at, you know, great distances can affect their seasonal movement decision making and thus affect sort of the patterns that we see playing out when we sample. So in this case, we, um, you know, we're continuing to assemble um, an ecosystem model. Again, this is in the Bering Sea, and I'm trying to walk through sort of simple to complex for the Bering Sea here. Um, you know, so for physics, we've got the same bottom and surface temperature and summer and winter, um, you know, both measurements and end of century forecasts. And in this case, I'm just going to do what's called a decadal forecast, so forecasting 2020 through 2030. We've got vertically integrated um, biomass samples of primary producers, chlorophyll A, and it's broken into spring and fall sampling and small and large chlorophyll because those have very different um, eco ecological dynamics. There's a secondary producer called copepods. It's like, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a small crustacean that um, is one of the way, you know, it grazes on primary producers and then produces itself eggs or, or these large individuals are eaten by fish and are an important source of fat for them. There's juvenile pollock that congregate on the surface. You know, pollock adults consume their own juveniles. And so the juveniles try to stay up in the surface, whereas the adults are lower in the water. So we've got a surface trawl for age zero juveniles. We've got, you know, five of these 12 species we looked at before in the summer bottom trawl. We've got seabirds where, um, you know, people over, you know, there's fanatics about seabirds who, you know, over the last 50 years have been stowing away on commercial or opportunistically on other types of vessels and just write down whatever seabirds they see. And so we've got this tremendous data set of seabirds. And then we've got capture processor fishing efforts. So this is sort of a, you know, this is this billion dollar annual industry of catching Pollock in this, this spring and fall. And we've got samples, you know, we've got records of where they're fishing in each year and each season that we want to line up with all these other processes. So in terms of data availability, you know, this is a, this is a big data set by sort of community ecology standards. Um, you know, we have any, you know, upwards of 10,000 samples in a given year. Um, you know, we've got very consistent sampling for adult fish over time. Seabirds goes in and out. We've got much uh, sparser sampling for the physics or for, um, you know, for um, juvenile, um, sorry, yeah, of secondary and primary production is what I meant to say. Um, and winter has the weakest coverage. <laughs> kind of looking at this in terms of seasonal and vertical extent, um, you know, we've got this winter surface satellite measurements. Um, you know, we've got summer bottom trawl and, some, you know, summer temperature associated with it. We've got spring and fall primary and secondary producers. We've got spring and fall fishing effort, and we've got kind of late fall um, seabirds is what we chose to look at. Um, and each of those has a different sort of vertical expression. So if we fit a joint model to all of these data, um, we can get a map of the average spatial variation. So um, looking at these, the bottom temperature in the ROMs, the kind of um, 
third from the left top column is sort of the average bottom temperatures, and we've seen that before. In the second row, I'll just pull out the spring chlorophyll A or CHLA in the spring for small or large has this hot spot shown in red in the in the western, the kind of west western southern portion. That's right by what's called Jemchug Canyon. It's the largest, geographically largest um, canyon in, in a continental slope, I, I, I think. I've been told that. And um, it sort of originates what's called the Bering Sea Green Belt, where nutrient rich waters flow up from deep water. They get sort of infected and mixed vertically by this canyon. And then that powers this spring chlorophyll bloom, um, which is an ecological hotspot for, for things that would forage there. Um, in the third row, we see that Kalanis in the spring starts out with high density in the south, and then by fall, it has higher density in the north. H0 pollock is distributed across the middle domain. Um, I don't have time to talk about all of these. That that in the bottom, the catcher processor or CP in the spring is focused in the south, in these red hot spots in the south. Um, whereas by fall, you know, ice is typically retreated north, and so they're spread out along the, the outer domain and up towards Jemchug Canyon. And their distribution ends up looking a lot like the adult Pollock distribution in the summertime Pollock distribution, which is that um, third row rightmost column, um, which makes sense. They're going to be congregated near adult pollock that they're fishing. Um, that ends up being sort of overlapping in spatial distribution with northern Fulmar distribution, which is the bottom row, second from the right column, and so on. So you can get these sort of whole of ecosystem, spatial temporal, spatial niche from, from lining these all up. In terms of modes of variability, the first mode of variability is um, has a 0.8 correlation with cold pool extent. So again, um, you know this system is you know may, all of these components are um, synchronously driven by you know something that's associated with the spatial extent of cold waters. Um, and because we've got Earth Systems Model forecast, we've got these two variables that we can project into the future. We project that. Um, the next 10 years are likely to stay warm. And so um, the likely condition, you know, this ecosystem will likely stay in its kind of like warm phase. The map of response to warm conditions for every variable looks like this. So in, in warm conditions, um, there's a weaker um, spring, uh, spring bloom near Jemchug. Canyon, and instead there's spring chlorophyll A blooms that are either further to the south near Pribilof or um, inshore, typically. Um, you know, the copepods also have a different distribution. In, in warming, pollock and cod move north. They move, they have high, these red values up in the northern part of the Bering Sea. Um, and uh, I think that's all I'll pull out for now. Um, you know, again, we can we can reconstruct sort of this picture of the ecosystem. So, you know, for somebody who doesn't spend any time thinking about the Bering Sea, you know, hopefully it's evident looking at a map like this that um, arrowtooth flounder, this sort of low commercial value fish that, that that competes with pollock, is projected to continue to spill from offshore onshore into by 2029. Um, the capture processor fleet you know, looks a bit like it does today. Um, Egg zero pollock, you know, continues to um, shift more inshore. Um, you know, water temperatures are projected to continue to go up in, in nearshore waters. Um, and so what's interesting as an ecologist is trying to think about how this affects ecosystem functions. So um, these variables are probably going to be more tightly linked when they have greater overlap. And so as an ecologist, we sometimes measure this using what's called Schoner's D. Um, so, you know, in every year we can calculate Schoner's D, we can forecast that due to this climate link. And, um, you know, essentially the story that comes out is that in warm years, like we had a warm stanza in, um, in the early 2000s. And during that warm stanza, there was less overlap between Aegis or Pollock and Fall Calanus. It's thought that Fall Calanus is what they eat to build up fat to survive the winter. There's greater overlap in the winter between Pollock, 
adult pollock and juvenile pollock, so there's more scope for predation. And in these warm stances, there's also greater overlap between arrowtooth and adult pollock. So these competitors are more likely to be strongly competing in warm years. Um, and then there's less overlap in warm years between shearwaters, these seabirds, and you know, summer fishing, the bee season fishing effort. So we can forecast all of these types of ecosystem connection into the future using this climate link model. And we essentially find that um, you know, for Pollock, this important fishery, you know, warming is predicted to in increase cannibalism and competition while decreasing overlap between juvenile Pollock and their, you know, important prey for, for first winter survival. So, um, you know, I guess, you know, I'll just end by saying that, um, you know, I've got a, I've got, a, you know, a four month old and a toddler. And I think a lot about what the world will look like for them. And, you know, while we were quarantining for COVID, um, you know, we were also stuck indoors in, in Seattle because of wildfires occurring in California. And, you know, I think that climate is this sort of ultimate example of teleconnections where, um, you know, as I've explained my toddler recently, you know, um, you know, essentially sort of, you know, Arctic amplification is causing the polar vortex to change in strength that affects how, um, you know, temperatures play out across the West Coast. And um, California is typically becoming drier, and that is associated with increased fires. And those fires then, you know, affect my toddler's ability to play outside during daycare. Um, and force him to be indoors with other people who might have COVID. So there's all these sort of interesting ways that um, humans and animals deal with ecological teleconnections and how those are being scrambled during climate change. And dealing with those, you know, will understand, you will require understanding individual movement better and ecological teleconnections. Um, you know, the other parts, the grand challenge, grand habitat challenge I laid out, stage structured effects will also be necessary. And um, I'll just pull out here that statisticians are needed for thinking about Earth systems models and decadal forecasting because stage structured effects um, lead to inertia um, in, in population dynamics. And that is a type of predictability that requires you to condition on recent conditions during decadal forecasting. So sort of a tighter integration of climate models with measurements would allow us to capture and improve predictability over a short, you know, annual to decadal forecasts of climate. And those annual and decadal forecasts are really what are necessary for me to know for my toddler, you know, whether it's going to be, you know, a, a, another year with a lot of fires next year or not. So, um, and then of course, these mechanisms linking independent variables, you know, um, fire is going to affect other things. Um, besides smoke, and those other things might affect my response to smoke, for instance. So thinking, you know, explaining, um, you know, attribution studies or prediction and require mechanistic understanding of what would otherwise be treated as independent variables. And that's a causal statistics story. Um, I'll, I'll say that we've, we're advertising for postdocs. We've got a two to three year postdoc on integrating climate forecasts and, and lower trophic level data. And so um, if anybody is a student or has students in their lab who are looking for postdocs, that's two to three years of funding. We're also doing data integrated movement models using a diffusion taxis movement process. Um, so feel free to email me directly if interested in learning more. And then again, I'll end by thanking, um, thanking you, John, and, and Roy Mendelson and others for organizing this. And I'll leave up some of these co-authors while I take any questions. Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, so please, anybody who has uh, questions, just feel free to, to jump in. I think we've got a few minutes, so um, go ahead. Well, this is Sam Shen from San Diego State University. I'm in the math department. Uh, so your first uh, the first part of your project, uh, you talk about three modes. Uh, 
I noticed that the first one explains 80, more than 80%. Second one is like uh, seven or 8%. The third one was like 1% or less. Uh, we have encountered one you know, similar problem with this, that when you get like 1%, can you actually explain anything? <laughs> and why there is such a sharp decrease uh, is that because you need to do some pre-processing, like standardize the data, et cetera? Yeah, so I'll, I'll say that, um, can you see my screen, by the way? I'm trying to- Yeah, I can screen. see that, yeah. Yeah, so um, thanks to your question and thanks for your interest. Um, so, uh, you know, since I've done this, I've been continuing to kind of explore, you know, model, I don't wanna, I don't want to subtract off the mean for every variable because these ecological samples have a meaningful mean variance relationship and they, you know, like using the Tweedy distribution has sort of a generative process, like a compound Poisson gamma process that is ecologically interpretable and gets lost if you do pre-processing of the data. But I do want to continue to improve the model structure. So to, to do the equivalent of the pre-processing you're saying. So in this case, you know, at the time I did this paper, you know, my claim was simply that um, the variance explained in this case is um, calculated from those loadings matrices. And it's, you know, it's just the um, column sum of squared values of that loadings matrix. Um, and that's where the first number is coming from. But the second number that's shown in parentheses is the percent of variance explained if I subtract off the mean value for every component. And so um, in this case, you know, that the idea of that kind of ad hoc calculation is that the first component is essentially explaining their spatial, their average spatial variation. You want to, when people do EOF, they typically subtract off the mean of physical data as a pre-processing step. And so they cut, the, you know, they leave that on the cutting floor before they do EOF anyway. And so if you do that D mean calculation of variance explained, the first one explains about 10%, the second one about 62%, and the third one about 27. So um, so that's, you know, that was sort of an ad hoc way of doing it at the time. You know, since then I've spent, you know, more time thinking about, you know, like the the third chapter, the third one of this, <laughs> um, there's a pure spatial effect that some, you know, deals with that component to begin with. And, um, and that's why um, by the third section, you know, I've got a pure spatial term. I guess I, sh I, should, have, I should have the equation in here, here but I've got a, a pure spatial term that doesn't vary over time. And then by the, you know, then the first mode of variability is about zero mean. So, you know, by the time I've done this study, I've kind of done some data processing in the model. Um, we can talk more if you're interested about sort of yeah, uh, and I'm very much interested in your uh, the way actually you presented EOF in this this way is a space time decomposition. Actually, in my book, I actually emphasize that traditionally people always talk about EOF from a covariance metrics, and so uh, now in a modern way, I think your your approach is really nice. I really like the way you present it. So. So I'd like to contact you more. <laughs> yeah, that's nice of you to say. Thank you. I, I you know, that um, I, if I'd had more time, I would have tried to put more details in, you know, that in dynamic factor analysis, there's sort of some identifiability criteria and, you know, I'd love to work, you know, think through with you and others, you know, how these different sort of structures, you know, to ensure identifiability play out in terms of inference. Great, great, good. Yeah. Let's uh, keep in touch. I will email, send you an email afterwards. <laughs> okay. yeah, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. We have time for questions. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Al. <laughs> One or two more questions, maybe. Sorry, John. No, yeah, I, I feel bad having people on the screen. It's always awkward looking at your own. So at least, John, you're stuck looking at yourself once you start talking. <laughs> So I, I have a question actually. Um, I think it was uh, some, your predictions on, I think it was like slide 31 or 32. Um, if you go back there, it was, uh, cause you showed 
kind of with and without EOF, I think. And I, I was kind of interested in sort of the discrepancies there. Um, yeah, so I, was that in that what I was calling like EOF regression? Uh, yeah, the, yeah, here it is exactly with EOF and without EOF. I was just kind of curious about, you know, the, the without EOF, it's just kind of a flat line, you know, extrapolating out. But with EOF, there's some some kind of, you know, up and down. And I'm, I'm just kind of curious because I'm, I'm used to projecting out being just maybe not a flat line, but but some sort of like linear or maybe curvilinear shape. So I'm, I'm interested in where those uh, kind of jagged edges are coming from. Yeah, so, um, so I glossed over one important detail that the forecasting in, in terms of these time series panels, you know, it, it's a stock recruit model. And so it, you know, the recruitment that's being predicted on the y-axis is a function. Well, I guess it's, um, it's it, it no the y-axis is log recruits per spawner but the point is that that varies as a function of spawners spawning biomass and in all of these both you know on the left hand column I'm forecasting at as if the current amount of spawners was constant into the future and we know that wouldn't be the case there's some other kind of separate submodel that would predict changes in spawning biomass under different fishing scenarios or whatever but um, you know, this is kind of a conventional way of presenting forecasts, at, you know, under the assumption that spawning biomass stayed the same. And, um, you know, without the EOF link, the model is, you know, the stock group model is, you know, in assuming that spawning biomass is constant over time, you know, it's the second equation here where S is fixed and there's no environmental linkage. So it's just constant over time. Um, you know, and in this case, the EOF is the only kind of in way that the environment is affecting the model. So the EOF linkage is the only way that it would have sort of variation over time during the forecast period. Um, you know, this might sound like sort of an artificially simple way of presenting a forecast, but this is actually how we do forecasting um, in many fisheries worldwide. <laughs> so um, the Alaska Fishery Science Center where I work um, it's part of the National Marine Fisheries Service. We, you know, we manage, you know, you know, ca catches for a tremendously large industry in Seattle and Alaska. And, um, you know, we just, for we do forecasts assuming that future recruitment is just the average of the last 30 years of recruitment. So this isn't sort of an artificially simplified example. <laughs> Interesting, thank you. Um, so uh, I think that's that's going to be it for for us today. So thank you again, Jim, for for a great talk. And uh, this will be uh, the recording will be posted on the Weenar website uh, in the near future. Uh, and and please stay tuned uh, for future uh, Weenar webinars. Yeah. So thanks again, Jim. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's a pleasure.